God bless you. Okay, turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, as we continue our look at this topic of Jesus, the light of the world. John chapter 9, the same passage that our brother Vinod uh, read for us this morning. We'll just read from verses 1 to 7, which I'll, I'll seek to share with you this morning. John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the man uh, with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore, and washed, and came seeing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll commit this time to him. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this precious word that we can hold in our own hands. We thank you that you have caused it to be so, that you have preserved it for us, and that we can trust every word within it, because your power is able to preserve and to um, uh, give these things to us now so that we can learn. We just pray that your spirit will be guiding us into your truth this morning. And we pray for your blessing upon us and the grace we need to live what we learn. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we have for the past few weeks been looking at this topic of Jesus is the light of the world. So he made this declaration in chapter 8 where he tells everyone in the temple, I am the light of the world. Whoever, If you have me, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. And we've seen over the past few weeks that some people had a problem with this. Uh, He was declaring himself to be God, essentially, and and, and aligning himself with God. And some people had a a big problem with him making the claims that he did. Even people who had begun to believe in him. Okay, when he tested them, we found out that they did not really believe at all. So one of the things that lessons that we learned is that just because a person says they believe in Jesus doesn't necessarily mean they believe in him. Because it will come to pass that they will either show it or not. And it's fitting that, uh, and we're going to finish this series with this chapter, although I'll be parking myself in this particular chapter for probably three weeks, I would say. And today we're only going through seven verses, but I'll have hopefully three points for you. But it'll take me, as per usual, about an hour to give you three, three points. Okay? You're not meant to laugh at that. <laughs> This is one of my favourite stories in the in the Bible. This is one of my favourite um, uh, uh, stories about what Jesus has done. I mean, Jesus healed a lot of people with various uh, illnesses and diseases. This is one of my favourite because it actually gives us a lot of detail about what was going on, okay, around this person as well. And even though we don't even know this person's name, okay, there is so much that we now know because of what happened to him, who he was, about his family, about the religious leaders of the day. There's a whole lot of things that have been opened up to us in this one chapter. And God devotes a whole chapter to this particular story. So it must be important to God. But we learn from this chapter, and I'm just going to preempt my message this morning, with that every miracle we see in the Bible that Jesus performs has a physical aspect to it, Correct. There's someone who's a leper that he cleanses is cured of leprosy. Someone who is blind can then see. Someone who is lame can then walk. So there's a physical aspect to every miracle. Are the miracles that Jesus did just symbolic? The answer is no. Okay. If the Bible says he walked on water, guess what? He walked on water. Okay. If the Bible says that he fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fishes, guess what? He did exactly that. 
But behind every story, behind everything that he actually did, there was another story. There is a, a, a physical thing that he did, but there is also a spiritual message behind it. Because the same things that he did to people physically, he does to them spiritually or can do for them spiritually. So not only is he able to open up the eyes of the physically blind, he's able to open up the eyes of the spiritually blind. And God had foretold this many years before. You see, 700 years or so before Jesus was born into the world, the prophet Isaiah was given a message from God. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, and we'll read verse 7 as well. And this speaks about the chosen servant of God, whom he was giving to the world. And this, these two verses speak about Jesus, okay, as the suffering servant. Isaiah 42, verse 6, says, I, the Lord, that's Jehovah, have called thee in righteousness. That's calling his son. And will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Now, did Jesus go busting open um, prisons and turning people loose in the streets? No. He didn't do that. What did he do? Well, he opened up the eyes of people who were in darkness. Okay, so they are living in darkness because they in they're in a spiritual prison. The Bible says that every person is a sinner, and because of that sin, they are in spiritual bondage. And only Jesus can open the doors and free you from that prison. And because he shot, I mean, prisons today aren't very nice places to be in but prisons in those days uh, didn't have a light switch so as soon as it got dark guess what you're in darkness okay complete anyone anyone been it close themselves in a room that's completely dark and no light do your eyes open up really wide to try to get as much light in, but you, but you can't see anything. It's actually uh, a bit scary sometimes, okay? Um, not that I'm scared of the dark, no. What? Oh. The point here is that Jesus is able to come into the darkness of where we live in our own uh, prison cell and he's able to free us because he brings light with him, okay? And he can open the door. And so when the Bible says he opens the eyes of the blind, these are the spiritually blind, which we all were at one stage. And Jesus opened up our eyes because he came and found us in the prison that we were in, where we were living in darkness. And you'll notice here this, this rather odd phrase. He says in verse 6, that he will give thee for a covenant of the people. I'll give thee as a as a as a covenant for the people. Um, I've, I've shared this with you in the past. You remember when God made a covenant with with uh, Abraham, and he actually made Abraham go to sleep, and and Abraham had brought to him various animals, sacrificial animals, and Abraham had cut them in half and killed them obviously slaughtered them um and then the 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 purpose in those days when you were making a covenant that was super serious you would both walk who was making a covenant two people would walk together in the middle of those carcasses okay so you'd have a a, a, a lamb okay you'd, you'd cut it you'd literally split it in half and you'd actually have one side here and another side there and you would walk up and down the middle of these carcasses which is um, what God had called Abraham to do because he was making a covenant with him. Instead, in this particular case, God, Abraham saw a light that went in between, like a flaming uh, torch that went in between. And God was saying, you don't have to walk here. This is me who's making a covenant with you. Okay. And the, the purpose of that is when you're walking in the middle of all this blood okay, and guts, okay, the, the thing is, the, the, the thing you're trying to say is, if I don't keep my side of the bargain here, may this happen to me. Okay, that's essentially what it is. But that 
was a it was a covenant that was typical in those days and so the lamb of god who was slaughtered okay is meant to be a symbol of that covenant so when god gave jesus christ to the world he gave him to us as the covenant okay he is the covenant the covenant is in him when he shed his blood he says this is the new covenant in my blood because it's in him and we have this living lamb sacrificial lamb a living one okay who is now eternally representative of the new agreement that god has made with mankind okay and so we have this wonderful agreement between God and us, which is salvation by grace through faith. And that covenant is in his son, Jesus. Okay, so this promise that God made to mankind that he would send his servant into the world to be the new covenant and to open up the eyes of the blind who were prisoners in their cells is something that has happened to most of us here, I suspect. Okay, So if you've come to put your faith in Jesus, that's what's happened to you. Your eyes have been opened. You've, you've been set free from the bondage of sin and death and the consequence of sin and death. And you no longer need to live in there anymore. Okay, You need to live a free life. And that freedom comes only in Jesus and when we keep our eyes on him. But I want to go back now to our story. Okay, I want to read the first three verses in John chapter 9. So that was my introduction. And it says there, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, this is not a man who's had an injury recently and, and, and Jesus heals that injury or something that's reversible. No, this, this person was born this way, never able to see, okay, from the time that he was born. And the fact that it calls him a man means that he's been many, many years in this particular state. Not something you just turn around in a moment with any, any particular operation that can be done. I doubt whether even an operation today could fix up a person who was born blind. He was obviously born with some deformity or deficiency in that way. And his family would, be, would have been aware of it because they would have raised him as a blind child for his whole life. And as you, as you notice, Jesus is passing by. So Jesus is literally walking down the street and he sees this person on the side of the road. And so his, his disciples go to him, look at this guy. Who sinned, him or his parents, that he's ended up like this? And so you might say, well, isn't that, what about his parents? I mean, how, how could a parent leave their child to go begging in the street? He probably would have been begging for a good portion of his life. But I want to remind you this morning that there was no NDIS in those days, okay? And if you were a, um, and if you were a, uh, a, a person who was uh, looking after his family, well, or most of it was rural uh, living, you'd have to go out in the fields and, and do your job, otherwise you weren't going to eat, okay? And normally it required both husband and wife to do the work, and normally they had larger families in those days because you know why? You want your kids to grow up and do the work as well. All right, to help you when you get old. Now, we don't know this, the, the, uh, the particular um, situation with his parents, but we do know that they were alive because in this story, they call them in to the actual temple to actually give a, 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 their verdict of what was going on here. We'll look at that in the coming weeks. But you might say, well, how could his parents leave him in the street like that and probably to beg? Well, the fact of the matter is that if you're, you're getting on in, in years, which they probably were, and they still have to work to eat, what do you do with that person? Okay, and so do you leave them at home by themselves? If you have to go out in the fields, what happens if something happens to him? Probably the safest place for him to be would have been in a place that was a busy corner. Okay, and that's the same place you go to beg. So if he can actually bring home some money, at least, from people who were, who were maybe uh, compassionate on him, and, and many people would wait around the actual temple. Huh? So if you, were, if you had all these people going in and praying 
and doing all that stuff, you know what I mean, and they were obviously more godly people, you'd rely on their compassion to give you something. Okay, So it was very common in those days for people who were blind to be begging. And this man pictures every person who is born in this world. Born spiritually blind, with no real prospect of life or or, um, or or change. And our fallen nature means that we are spiritually blind to the things of God. And it takes the light of God through Jesus to help us to see. And you'll notice the question the disciples asked. And they said, this guy, look at him, Lord. I mean... Obviously, he's not living a very good existence here. He's not, you know, doesn't have any wealth, health or prosperity going on for him. He's, you know, what did he do? God's obviously judged him, right? You know, so, so who, who, who seemed this guy or his parents? And so there was a doctrine in those days and for a long time after held by the religious people including the pharisees and the sadducees and the disciples had probably heard this teaching over and over and over again the teaching went something like this that if someone suffers from some sort of terrible disease if they get leprosy or if they're lame or if they're blind and especially born blind like this man um it must have been the result of god's judgment on you god must have judged that person they must have been so bad that God actually judged them and gave them this particular disease or result. And so since this man had been born blind, well, okay, well, he was born blind, so he really didn't get a chance to do anything wrong himself, right? It must have been his parents who messed up pretty bad. Who knows what type of sin these people were involved with to give you a, a child for God to give you a child that is born blind. So it must have been. And so they, they, they're confused. Who, If he's born blind, you know, who was it that sinned like that? Did God judge the son because of the sins of the parents? But it wasn't just that. You see, this doctrine didn't just relate to people that had really bad diseases. Okay, It extended to your social status as well. So if you were from a poor family, guess what? God had judged you. So if you were poor and living pretty lean, it must have meant that you weren't living a godly life, that you must have been a big sinner because God is not giving you the rewards of a godly life. Your family must have been sinners for God to, to curse you all the way down the line. Instead, if you were from a wealthy family, guess what? God must be blessing you because that family must be godly because of your blessings. And so that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those days were strong advocates of this position. And because of this, this particular teaching that they held to, guess what it caused you to do? It caused you to judge everyone who is under you. Everyone. Which means if you're not as wealthy as I am, if you're not as healthy as I am, if you don't have what I have, you can't be anywhere near me, can you? So they they were in a situation where they would judge anyone else from a lower social status. If you were poor, if you had a disability, if you had something else going on, especially if you're a sinner, you know what I mean? There was no way God was going to bless someone like you. And it's the reason when you look at the what these guys got up to, Remember when they when they would give money to the poor, give alms, what they would do? They'd blow their trumpets, right? I don't know. Anyone carry trumpets around these days? No, you guys don't carry trumpets. Why would you be blowing trumpets, announcing to everyone about how you know how you were giving money to the poor? Because you were really announcing, God has blessed me. And here I am for you. Okay? This is why you had the tassels and the long robes and the best seats in the feasts. You wanted that because you were showing everyone else about how God had blessed you. Which meant you were saying in a roundabout way, 
this is how godly I am. Do you remember the, the story of the Good Samaritan? Remember the, the fellow who was, you know, he was beaten up. He was left there lying on the side of the road. And then you have the situation that Jesus says, well, you've got a priest who walks by and a Levite who walks by and they don't go anywhere near him. Why? Because you know why? Because that guy deserved exactly what he got. That guy must have been a sinner to, to go through something like that. God must be judging that person, so we don't want to dirty our hands with sinful people. When bad things happened to people around them, they looked at it as God's judgment on those people. And instead of having compassion, it caused them to judge them even more. Which is why Jesus berates them over and over and over again. He sees his people, they are spiritually proud, but he says that they're actually blind. And it's the reason that they hated Jesus, because Jesus spent time with who? The poor, the diseased, the sinners, the people. They said, if you're a man of God, why would you be going anywhere near these people? God has judged these people. You shouldn't be anywhere near them. You should come and spend time with us because we're the holy ones. So Jesus spending time with outcasts and cripples and Samaritans and sinners and prostitutes and they're going, no, nah, this guy can't be from God because if he was from God, he wouldn't be hanging around with these types of people. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think this doctrine has disappeared in our day? Do you think it's disappeared? The answer is absolutely not. You see, the same doctrine keeps going and regurgitating itself over and over and over again. And do you think it's this doctrine has, be, has disappeared from independent Baptist fundamentalist churches? I tell you no. In fact, the challenge we have is because we have the Word of God and we believe the Word of God, the challenge we have is the same, that we would think of ourselves more highly than other people. Because we've got the truth here. You know? We've got the KJV. And anyone else who doesn't read a KJV is not from God. And God is going to judge them. Um, we have to be very, very mindful of our attitude towards people around us. Because this doctrine has not disappeared in our day. There are many who judge other people okay who call themselves christians and they'll judge you by what happens to you okay they'll judge you by um the choices you've made in life by your social status by how well you're dressed by how um how much money you have you're standing in the church and within your community we need to be very careful of this some in our circles even, even go so far as to judge people as to whether they're worthy to hear the gospel or not. Okay, So they'll even say that that person is such a sinner that they are not worthy for me to share the gospel with them. All right? And I think some of you probably know what I'm talking about already. This is the highest form of Phariseeism and hypocrisy as they believe they're justified to withhold the light of the gospel from someone because they are not worthy of it. But that means they were. Okay? I am worthy for God to give me the light and for me to accept the light, but for me to share that light with someone else, maybe they're a Muslim. Eh? Maybe they're, they're someone who says they're gay. No. I can't go to that person. God's judged that person. Therefore, I choose to withhold the gospel from them because they're not worthy of it. Now, let me tell you, what's the, ask you, what's the difference? Is there a difference? There is none. There is none at all. Because the moment we begin to prejudge people based on their social status or their sin or the, the type of life they live, then we are playing God and not the Christian. 
And this is where Jesus sheds light on this commonly held view in his day. Who had sinned? I mean, who, who was the one that sinned so bad that this guy was blind, sitting on a, on a side of a road, you know, asking for money from people? Who was it, Lord? And he says in verse 3, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, is Jesus saying here that this guy's never sinned? Well, that's impossible because the Bible says, for all have sinned, okay? So what's he saying? Well, he's saying that this guy hasn't sinned more than anyone else, really, or has done something so atrocious and so heinous that, that God would intervene and judge him in this particular way. And now Jesus opens up a whole new possibility here, okay? That this man who was looked on by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the lawyers as a sinner, not to be touched, was actually a vessel in which the works of God were going to be made manifest. That he was there, an empty vessel, ready for God to fill with his grace. This is the opportunity, Jesus is saying, that God will be glorified in this man. And God would reveal himself through this man. Now, wow, that's, that's a huge thought when you think of it. Okay, um, And I wonder if we all thought like this, when the Lord brings someone in our life that is not like us, who doesn't dress like us, who doesn't speak like us, who isn't the good old-fashioned Baptist, who doesn't behave like us. Maybe if we looked at that person and said, that person's a vessel in which God can pour his grace in and be glorified in. Maybe that would change the way we respond to people who are different to us. Because God can raise the dead. God can do anything. And if there's an opportunity for God to do a miracle here, the question is really going to be, because Jesus is going to do the works of his Father, the question for us is, will we? Are we going to get our hands dirty? Are we going to be the type of people who says, no, no, I'm going to go to that person? Or I'm going to spend time with that person? Because God, this is an opportunity for God to be glorified. Turn to Matthew chapter 9 with me for a moment. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. <coughs> Who did Jesus came to save? <coughs> Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat... In the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, just to stop there just for a moment. Okay, so what's going on here? So, Jesus has just called Matthew, the tax collector, who's sitting in a booth collecting taxes for the government. And these people were despised by the Jews because they were collecting for also the Romans and that. And they were often people who were ripping people off. So, if you owed them ten Shekel, you, they would say, you owe me 15, and they would pocket the rest, okay? And then they were doubly despised because they were, most of them, dishonest. And the, and the other one, they were making a percentage on everything. So, so the government would actually contract out the tax system. Does that make sense? Okay, so the people collecting taxes were contractors, and that's how they made their money, okay? And so they would often do things that were wrong because there probably wasn't the same amount of account accountability in those days. But anyway, they were hated. So Jesus comes to Matthew and says, come and follow me. And, G and Matthew gets up and says, all right, I'm done with this. I'm going to follow him. And he starts, begins to follow Jesus. Now, guess who most of Matthew's mates would have been? Other tax collectors. Okay. Other publicans. They're called publicans. Okay. So... Matthew decides to put a feast on for Jesus and his disciples at his house. 
And so he invites them, Jesus, I want you to come to my house. You know, come and bring all you. I'm going to choose to follow you. I'm going to, I believe in you. So he brings the whole lot over to his house. And guess what he does? He invites along all his buddies. All his tax payer buddies, or tax, tax uh, whatever they're called, <laughs> not tax payers, they were tax receivers, and sinners that they were commonly spending time with. You see, these people weren't spending time with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes. These weren't the guys who would go into the temple every day and get their Bible lesson for the morning and, and go off to work. Um, now, these guys who were probably living very much on the edge of anything that might have been called religious in those days. And so now all of a sudden you got Jesus, his disciples, and a whole lot of sinners all having lunch or dinner together, right? Probably it was lunch. And so look at verse 11. So when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, uh, uh, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What was Jesus saying to the world? To save sinners. And the, the sinners that he saved were the sinners who recognized themselves as sinners. Because those who thought they were so good and so righteous, they looked at everyone else, you know what? They didn't think they needed Jesus. But Jesus rebukes these people, the Pharisees. They should know better because they knew the word of God. And the word of God says to show mercy to those who are not the same as you. To show mercy to the ones who are not righteous. The lost sheep need to be found. Not the ones who are already comfortable and safe in the flock. And Jesus reserves his greatest judgment for those who were doing the judging before. You see, it's God's business to judge not ours in fact the scriptures say that we are to judge within the household of god not those outside it's not our business to be judging them it's our business to judge ourselves but those who are outside he says god's going to judge them so our job is to reach them before the final judgment that they're going to go through and so Jesus reserves his greatest judgment for those who were doing the judging. Those who thought they were righteous already. Those who were in a better position than other ones because God wasn't judging them for their sin. So therefore, they and their families were godly people. But the truth of the matter is that those people needed salvation as much as those ones who were poor and sinners and publicans. Turn to Luke chapter 13, verse 1 with me. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. This is not the only place Jesus speaks about this, this topic. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Now listen carefully. There were present at that season some that told him, that's Jesus, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He killed them and then mixed up their blood with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, that's, that's surely the judgment of God, right? And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon the, uh, whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. Except ye, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So, 
a tower falls down. Okay, so there's, unfortunately in Morocco, there's been a terrible earthquake where that looks like thousands of people have died. Okay, and you look at that, and the temptation might be to say, that's God's judgment. They're Muslims there, aren't they? That doesn't come from God. That thought. That thought comes from the devil. That thought comes from the flesh. And Jesus is saying, there's a particular tower in, in, uh, in Jerusalem that fell, at the Pool of Siloam, that fell on eight, and killed 18 people. I'm sure it would have been like a, a, an urban legend, okay, about, you know, these guys who were sitting there, they must have been bad guys. They must have been such bad people that God would cause a towel to fall and, and crush them to death. And, and Jesus is saying to them, oh, do you think that those guys are worse than all the other ones? Because that happened to them. Uh, no. But unless you all repent, you're all going to perish. He doesn't mince his words. And he's telling them, don't think you're better than anyone else. Don't think you're better than other people. Don't think that you are worthy because you got saved or because you know the truth or because you have the word of God or because you might be better off financially or with your health that you are somehow more worthy of God's grace than someone else. When you see someone trapped in a lifestyle of sin, show them the same mercy that God has shown you. It is not our job to judge people in this world. Not our job at all. We are called to judge ourselves and to declare the gospel to those who are living in the bondage of darkness, who are locked in a prison by their sin and by an evil adversary that we all have if we are believers. And we need to believe that despite whatever they, they're doing in their life, that God can save the worst sinner? Or do you think that if someone like Daniel Andrews chose tomorrow to actually start killing Christians, that that would put him beyond the grace of God? You've all gone quiet. Because I know a number of you already find this man quite distasteful okay that he is actually principally he's actually opposed to christianity okay he's very progressive with his thoughts okay he may have even included and, and, and introduced laws that are contrary to christians yeah i get that um and hasn't killed any christians so far right i remember a particular man who was a pharisee who went around killing Christians, who went around actually pulling them out of their houses and making sure that they were stoned and thrown into prison. That fellow was called Saul. And God saved him, and we are blessed because God saved a sinner like Saul. So we need to be careful about who we prejudge, okay? Because God can save the worst sinner and take out of prison those who are living in complete darkness. So which brings us to verse 4 and 5. John chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. And this is what Jesus says. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You know, pointing someone to Christ brings them light, shows them the light. And they can see things they maybe never seen before the truth of jesus is the very thing that opens up the the eyes of those who are spiritually blind and as long as he says he was in the world he says he was the light of the world but what did he mean by the night cometh when no man can work what does that actually mean when I mean, he says while i'm in the world i am the light of the world okay but there's going to come night soon when no man can actually work. The reason there was day at all in the world is because Jesus was the light of the world and he was in the world. Okay? The reason there was day. So, you, so Jesus is saying you work during the day. You can't work during the night. 
Okay? And while Jesus was in the world, work could be done because he is the light of the actual world. And who was doing the work? He was. He is fulfilling the works of God. And so Jesus was called to work until the night came. And so the, the analogy here is that in those days, and we have a we have a um, we have quite a different lifestyle to what they had in those days. Do you agree with me? Very different. People are the same, but the lifestyle is different. All right. At night, who will go home? What time does it get dark now? Six thirty. Okay. Who goes home at night at six thirty and shuts all the blinds and goes to sleep? Anyone? You're not very good Baptist then. Who gets up as soon as the sun rises? Anyone here? Well, we have one over here on the corner. <laughs> he put his hand half, half up. Okay. The reason we live very different lives to those who were living in those days is because we have thing, uh, something called electricity. Okay. And so we have switches all around our house. And you can go into your home and you can turn a light on and you can stay up to whatever time you like. You can read, you can watch TV, you can do whatever it is while it's completely dark outside. But what did a person do in Jesus' day? No electricity. The best you can have is maybe a candle or a, or a, um, or a lamp that you gave you. Have you ever tried to be in a room like this with a candle? You can't get much done, can you? Okay. So I want you to think about when they would do all their work in those days well they did it from the time the sun went up to the time the sun went down and when the sun went down no one's working okay work is over you're at home with your family and you're probably getting ready for for bed for sleep okay for the next day so we live very different lives and that's exactly what jesus is speaking about here he's saying there's a when night comes no one works when night comes but what night is he actually talking about? Um, if he's the light of the world, when was the light just extinguished? Turn to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. while he was in the world he was a light of the world and he was doing the works of God and he had to complete the works of God but when did night come and Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8 says he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was you stricken what happened who's he speaking about here that's Jesus What's the saying happened to him? He was cut off out of the land of the living. Okay. Now I want you to turn to John chapter 12 with me for a moment. John chapter 12 verse 31 to 36. Okay, so Jesus is cut off the land of the living when he, when he dies. John 12, 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to, my, to me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. What was that death? Crucifixion. The people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So, so they were saying to him, hang on, but we've heard that the, that the Messiah is meant to live forever. He's going to be abiding with us forever. What do you mean he's going to be lifted up and crucified? They knew what he was talking about because that was probably a phrase they would use in those days. There's another one lifted up. There's another one lifted up. They knew that phrase. And they said, how can you say that he's going to be lifted up? Who is this guy that you talk? Who is the son of man? Verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is a light with you. 
walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. <coughs> while ye have the light, that's him, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things Jesus spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. What's what's it saying here? Jesus saying, yet, verse 35, yet a little while the light is with you. A little while. Yeah, a little while. The light was with them for only a short time. And there was coming a day when that light would be extinguished. And it would be held up and it would be snuffed out on a cross. And that is when darkness came. Look at John 13, 26 now. Look at John, Jesus telling them, the light's only with you for a little while longer. Walk in the light. Make the decision to believe in the light. John 13, 26 says, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a salt. He's speaking about Judas, who is about to betray him. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto them, That thou doest, do quickly. And no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, which means he was a treasurer, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Verse 30, He then, having received the sop, went immediately out. How does your Bible verse finish? And it was night. The devil had entered Judas Iscariot. Night was falling. And the devil was his master plan which was to kill the Son of God, was now in full effect. Okay, His strategy to use Judas to kill, to betray Jesus, so that he would be given to the Romans and that Jesus would be crucified on the cross, was now all coming to pass and Jesus was allowing it to happen. He didn't resist it. He just allowed it to all happen you see jesus had completed all the works that god had sent him now it's he'd reached that final crossroads and he was just going to allow himself to be taken and so luke twenty-two fifty-two. actually turn with me there luke twenty-two fifty-two. Luke twenty two fifty two Night had fallen. Then Jesus said unto the chief the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him Be ye come out against the thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple he stretched forth no hand against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. You see, darkness was descending. And look at Luke, look at Luke 23, 44. And it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. No man can work. No man can work because darkness had fallen upon the earth. The greatest sin that mankind has ever, ever done is to take the holy Son of God, convict him as a criminal, and then hang him on a tree that is the worst sin that mankind has ever ever that is cr the crescendo of our sinfulness I mean we look at that in hindsight now and we say what a wonderful thing God did for us but from our perspective 
There is nothing worse that we could have ever done than to kill the only perfect thing in the world and to call him the worst of us. No man can work. Jesus' work was complete. He had been betrayed. His disciples, you remember, weren't working. They ran. They were scattered. They were fearful without their master. The devil seemingly triumphant. Night had fallen across the world. The power of darkness had made its greatest and final push. And now the light was about to be extinguished. Let me remind all of you that each of us has been given a certain amount of time to do the works that God has asked for us to do. Only a small time. Some of you may think you have plenty of time, but we don't know. But God, the Bible says, has pre-prepared for us works that we should walk in them. Now, Jesus did that perfectly. We don't. We fail. But we only have one day to work. Take your day. Do the works that God has called you to do. Don't throw away the opportunity that you have because one day night will fall on you as well. When you can't work, when you can't do any more, well, whatever you've done here, you will take with you into eternity. And there's no chance to change things after that. Don't squander the precious day that you have because Jesus' light is shining inside you. When God takes you home, there is no more time for work. Work and work hard. Because there's nothing we're going to take into eternity other than what we've given him and what he's given us. And I want to close with these last two verses. Go back to John 9, 6 and 7 as we look at just finally this miracle that he did. John 9, 6 says, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of a spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing, praise God. No. Isn't that an unusual thing? I mean, did Jesus have to make clay with spit and thing and then rub it into the guy's eyes and anoint them and then say now you've got to go to the pool of Siloam and, and you know wash that off did he have to do it that way did Jesus need clay to fix a man's eyes well the, the short answer to that is no not at all in fact this is the only place that's recorded that he did this type of miracle with the clay in the eyes in fact other places he doesn't do that at all he just touches their eyes and they're immediately healed. I mean, Jesus could take a fellow who had leprosy, probably limbs falling off, and just touch him and he, all of a sudden his, all his skin is, is brand new again, like a baby skin. So did he need that? Well, the, the obvious answer to that is no, because he'd heal other people in different ways. Um, but there is other story about Jesus healing blind people. Um, remember, before we look at this particular passage, Remember, every miracle that Jesus does has a deeper spiritual truth to it. Okay, It has, yes, he heals blind people, but there's something else going on that he wants you to understand. So turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. Matthew 9, verse 27. This is a, another story about Jesus healing people, and you're going to notice a difference here. Matthew 9, 27 says, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. 
Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. Did you notice something different in the story? What has this man who we're looking at, what has he said? Nothing. The guy, the guy said nothing. Jesus went up to him. Okay? Jesus has gone up to him. The guy hasn't come crying to Jesus. There's no, there's no, there's no particular uh, evidence that, that he's come to Jesus saying, please heal me, I believe in you. No. In fact, we're going to find out later on, he's telling you who Jesus was. Okay? But he, it says that in these guys, they said, we believe, and they call him Lord, and they had faith. This man Jesus has gone up to hasn't made that claim. He hasn't exercised faith in Jesus. But look at verse 7. It says of John chapter 9, And he said unto him, So he's put the clay on his eyes, and he says, Now go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which by is by interpretation sent, he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. You know, it was the grace of God that gave him his sight, but faith received it. You see, no one goes and obeys a command without believing. I mean, who's going to go and do something that they don't really believe? He should have said, don't touch me. You know, I'm going to take it off now. Instead, he goes to the pool of Siloam, does exactly what Jesus actually told him to do, and he comes back seeing. He sent him to a pool where he washed, and that pool was called Scent. So he sent him to the Scent to wash and receive his sight. Who do you think that's picturing? It pictures him. The story is all about him. You see, he sent him to a pool. Who's the sent one? It's Christ whom God sent into this world. And where do we get washed? With him, by his blood. Who gives us our sight? He does. You see, the picture is of a person who is born again. So the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, and you should be able to finish this verse off. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see it. The man had the first opportunity to exercise faith. And he did. Praise God. It wasn't the work that he did that saved him. It was the fact that he showed faith in Jesus that opened up his eyes. And it was the grace of Jesus to give him something that was there, but he had to take it by faith and to receive it. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. God is pours out his grace all the time. But there are so many people who reject his grace because they have no faith. It's faith that receives the grace of God. And this man received the grace that Jesus gave him. But in contrast to this, as we've seen at the beginning of this sermon, there is an opposite view. I'm going to close with this passage. Romans chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Because... Salvation by grace through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone is the message we preach. But you can even take that and turn it into religion. Look at what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. All right? The church of Laodicea. Revelation 3.17 Because Thou sayest, I want you to think of the Pharisees as I'm reading this to you, okay? And those who were condemning the blind man as someone who God had judged and condemning people who weren't the same as them, I want you to think of them. Because, 
Revelation 3.17 Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see do you see what the, what the church of Laodicea was saying about itself they were rich didn't need anything else that's exactly what the Pharisees were saying when Jesus arrived we're rich we've got everything God has already blessed us obviously we're good enough why would we need you you know get out of the way because we don't need you the later seasons believed that they were rich had plenty of goods and didn't need anything and they had fallen into the same trap that the Pharisees had fallen into who thought they were better but Jesus says they needed true riches riches in Christ they needed white raiment white clothes which is the righteousness of Christ they needed the truth of the gospel which is the light of Christ they needed their eyes opened whom only Christ can open religion can keep you blind to God's truths yes we are born spiritually blind but religion will trap you just as well as not even believing in God at all okay as we read the scriptures the Bible says that God offers riches in Christ righteousness of Christ and to have your eyes opened up by Christ so this morning if there is any here who has not received those things in Christ if the question is are you following a religion are you following some sort of a system do you think yourself that you don't need the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God to save you if you are then I would beg you and implore you to reconsider turn to Christ have your eyes opened to the truth and receive him as your savior today and for those of us who are saved beware lest we fall into the same trap that the Pharisees did let's judge righteously but let's reach those people who are living in darkness for his glory god bless you thank you